Um, we're going to go ahead and officially start now. Again, welcome everybody. This is Chris talking. If you are having trouble hearing me, or if I'm going too fast, go ahead and send us a message. We have a lot to cover in this hour, so I'm going to go over some parts very quickly, and other parts I'll slow down when it gets a little bit more complex. So again, just send me a text if uh, I'm going way too fast, but I do plan on speeding through and getting you guys out on time. All right, so this is the second session of our syntax class. We are going to be covering the grammar portions that you need to know from your standards. If I can get this to advance. There we go. All right, we are going to start um, with just a fun little activity, find the mistake. So if you would look at that first sentence, basically it's the principle that internet service providers should treat all traffic equally. If anyone can find the mistake and type it in, and if anybody could tell me why that mistake, All right, so Stacy is saying it's principal with L E instead of principal with A L, which is correct. Nancy also sees that. And Deb, does anybody know why? Anne says that's her boss, that's correct. The L E spelled wrong, wrong homophone. Very good. The principal that is the A L is the person or the chief in charge, and L E is the truth or the rule. All right, as we saw last year, the weather can have a significant effect on a farmer's fortune. All right, Denise and Nancy both see that the mistake is effect. Stacy notes that effect is the verb and affect is the noun, which is correct. All right, next one, Mr. Sharon's body laid in state for several hours on Sunday as mourners paid their last respects. All right, I think that Deb is reading that last one. Anne thinks something's wrong with Mr. This is a hard one. Ah, Deb got it. It's the word laid is incorrect. I could figure out how to draw. All right, here's one that um, I wasn't familiar with either, but laid is the past tense of lay, and lay is the word that we're supposed to use when there's a direct object, like lay down the plate on the table. And the correct form would be lay, which would be the past tense of lie, which is what we use when there's no direct object. All right, the last one. The contractor did not go into detail about whose responsibility it was to remove the pipe. All right, um, and Deb from before saw that earlier, I think. It's the who's, and it's not who is, which is what that contraction stands for. It's whose responsibility. Nice. All right, so that's just a little warm up to get us thinking about correct grammar. I'm going to pass that next slide and go right to our essential question. How can I teach students to access complex text? What is syntax and how do I incorporate it into Common Core instruction? And I'll let you read the objectives for tonight. All 
right, the next slides are going to get into each grade level. So the kindergarten slides should look like they're note taker. And these are the grammar pieces that we are going to be talking about for kindergarten. Um, some are simple, and I'm not going to talk about them. And some get a little bit more difficult. So here we go. All right, noun, regular, plural. Oops, did I go? Yeah. I'm going to skip nouns and verbs. And we'll just go right to regular, plural nouns. And the regular plural nouns are just the nouns that add the S or the ES when they're plural, like dogs, cats, and trees. Interrogatives are those question words, like what, where, when, why, and how. Inflections are the endings we put on words, like when we're conjugating verbs, the S and the ED. Example, sits or jumps. Affixes include prefixes and suffixes, and they're added to a base word to change its meaning. Some common ones are un, re, re, full, and less. Your example, examples are painful and redo. All right, right to the quiz. So this is where I want to see, well, actually, Sarah's going to set something up for us. Sarah set up a poll, so you just type it in. So what is an interrogative? All right. Okay. All right. It, it looks like we're finished. And I have three of you marked B, the question, and six of you marked C, the word that denotes the question, and the interrogative is actually the word that denotes the question. So nice job. We will continue. Please let me know. Oh, Janice says she wants to change the answer. Yes. Don't worry about it, Janice. We got it. Um, we're going to move on to first grade. I will slow down as the concepts get more difficult, but please let me know if I'm speeding too quickly. All right, moving on to first grade, looking at personal pronouns, possessive pronouns, indefinite pronouns, conjunctions, determiners, articles, demonstratives, prepositions, simple sentences, and compound sentences, including declarative, interrogative, imperative, and exclamatory. Janice is asking a little slower. Thanks, Janice. All right, so the three types of pronouns that first graders will work with are personal, which is um, about specific people like I, you, he, she, and it when you're referring to that person. There's the possessive pronoun showing um, belonging or possession. My, mine, your, yours, his, hers. And the indefinite pronouns are ones that don't refer to anything in particular, like anybody, no one, and, no, and nothing. And they're not definite in meaning. All right, moving on to conjunctions. The purpose of conjunctions are to join two independent clauses. And a reminder that independent clauses are clauses that can stand alone. And your examples are and, or, or but. And I don't know if anybody was watching TV last night, but they had the Schoolhouse Rock Top 5 videos, which are always a good resource. And you can YouTube any of those. Um, videos now and show them to your class. They're really meaningful. But no one knows about them anymore. All right, determiners mark the nouns in the sentences. So the, whoops, I'm, I made a grammar mistake. My, comma, some, which, seven, this. 
So that would be like my dog or which book. More determiners are articles or the demonstratives. Articles are a type of determiner and include the word the, a, and an. And demonstratives are another type of determiner that point to a particular noun and include the words this and those. All right, types of sentences. A simple sentence has one independent clause, which includes the subject and the verb, like the cat ran. And a compound sentence has two independent clauses joined by a conjunction and a comma, the cat ran and the dog chased it. All right, the four types of sentences. Declarative states the fact. Interrogative asks a question. Imperative is a command or request. And explanatory expresses excitement or emotion. All right, so here is our next poll. Or not? I don't think I, I, I missed this oh. one accidentally. Sorry. That's okay. We can use do the text chat. So instead of having a poll, we're going to use the text chat. What do you see in the sentence that might have to do with the first grade um, standard or first grade grammatical term? I've, I've heard what's in your pantry and I do not wish to see. All right, Denise sees that it's a compound, or yes, a compound sentence. I've seen what's in your pantry, joined by a comma and the conjunction and. I do not wish to see. It's an exclamatory sentence. A lot of the same replies are coming through. A possessive noun, a possessive pronoun. Your pantry, yes, I see it. So this sentence comes right out of the, um, the wrap from Spider and the Fly. I tried, when I was getting the examples, to pull them out of resources that um, Washoe County is using. And this would be a really great example of a juicy sentence you could use with your first graders. All right, moving on to second grade. Oh, nope, here's our short quiz. Here, I do have a poll I could post on that one. All right, go ahead and type in your answer. This is an indefinite pronoun. All right, everyone has responded and everyone chose no one, which is the correct answer. Indefinite pronouns are not specific to any noun. Now second grade. And remember that just because these terms are listed for second grade does not mean there's not more involved. I, what I did was I only added the ones that were not seen in previous grades. So second grade would include all of these plus the previous grade terms. Collective nouns, irregular plural nouns, reflexive pronouns, irregular verbs, adjectives, adverbs, commas, and apostrophes used in contractions and possessives. All right, so nouns. Two new types of nouns that second graders need to know about are collective nouns which are talking about a collection of things taken as a whole, like a pride of lions or a flock of birds. Janice is asking if um, we could have a copy of, our, of the PowerPoint, because I'm going too fast, it's hard to take the notes. I believe we can uh, make those available. Yes, Sarah is pointing out, she said, we will 
post that in Edmodo. And irregular plural nouns are nouns that don't behave in, um, they do not become plural in the regular way by adding ES or S. My foot turns to feet, else turns to L. Then you ask to fill me lie. Reflexive pronouns. I was so excited when I read about this one because it's been driving me crazy when people refer to themselves as myself. I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't figure out why. You know, like, um, I went to this, no, that's not right. Um, she gave it to myself. It's supposed to be preceded or followed by the noun to which it refers. So John pinched himself. And then I wrote the little thing. Now I can explain why it's not correct to say he chose Mary, Tom, and myself. Because you didn't re re refer to me or I in the sentence. All right, irregular verbs that don't conjugate in the simple past and past part of part of participle by adding s or ed. So drive changes to drove and driven, swim turns to swim and swum. And two types of descriptive words, adjectives and adverbs, which everyone knows, but I just like to have that um, official definition. Adjectives qualify a noun or a phrase and an adverb modifies the verb. All right, a little bit about punctuation. Second graders should use commas and greetings and closings of letters, and they should be familiar with apostrophes and contractions and possessions. And I just went over this with my second graders today. They tend to want to add a or a, an apostrophe onto any word it ends in an S. And I use a juicy sentence to explain why that's not true. All right. A quiz, go ahead and type in your answer to the text. Name an irregular verb and an irregular plural noun. Open the poll. So if you wouldn't mind putting your answers down in the text box so we can see. Stacy already did hers. All right, so Stacy added um, by and bought for the irregular verb and foot and feet for an irregular plural noun. Sorry, I can't see anybody else's responses. I'll do that. Oh, here we go. Cindy 
came up with SWAM for the irregular verb and spelled. Oh, thank you, Janice. My sink, sink, sunk. Good. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to third grade. Some of the new grammar terms for third grade, abstract nouns, regular and irregular verbs, subject verb agreement, pronoun antecedent agreement, possessive, comparative adjectives and adverbs, superlative adjectives and adverbs, coordinating conjunctions, subordinary, subordinating conjunctions, complex sentences, and quotation marks. I see Latanya's nice. There's another irregular noun. All right, so an abstract noun is a noun which you cannot physically interact with your five sense senses, like honesty and bravery. Regular and irregular verbs. Regular verbs follow the typical conjugation rules by adding S, ING, and ED, like walked, walking, and walked. While irregular verbs do not follow that typical pattern, like flies, flying, flew. All right, agreement. So the subject verb agreement. A singular subject takes a singular verb, so the list is on the table, where the verb matches the noun. And the pronoun antecedent agreement, the pronoun agrees with the noun that it's replacing. So President Lincoln delivered his speech. Adjectives and adverbs again, but now we're talking about comparative and superlative. So smaller and, and friendlier are the comparative adjectives, and superlative um, are the smallest, friendliest. Conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, join two independent clauses. We talked about that in first grade. So the most common ones, and, but, for, not, so, yet, nor. Subordinating conjunctions linked to a subordinate or dependent clause. And some examples are though, until, after. So stay in the bath until the phone rings. Complex sentences include one independent and one dependent clause. So the car swerved to miss Mrs. Jackson, who had slipped off the pavement. The pavement. So the car swerved to miss Jack. To miss Mrs. Jackson is your independent clause, and who had slipped off the pavement is your dependent clause. It cannot stand on its own. All right, for punctuation, third graders should use quotation marks in dialogue, and they should be familiar with the use of an apostrophe to indicate a relationship of possession, like the boys, like. All right, so, is this okay? All right, so for, type this in your text chat. What do you see in this sentence? And this is again from a close read from third grade. But I show him, showed him how he could stand up on his hind legs and look in the window and see me in there, selecting my book. And he was okay as long as he could see me.
So Nancy and Anne notice it's a complex sentence. There's a question, are we only looking for third grade? And no, because the other standards are also included. And in my experience, the kids aren't really comfortable with the previous grade level standards yet. So it's perfectly appropriate to go back. I see lots of conjunctions. Is this sentence grammatically correct? Right? It's a long sentence. Is that a run on? We would have to dive deeper into that sentence to check it out. Pronoun antecedent agreement. Coordinating conjunctions. Subject verb agreement. Regular verb. Example showed. And regular nouns, I'm assuming, as in lakes and books. There's lots of ands and maybe a comma like. I'll have to refer to my grammar girl book to make sure I know what comma like is. Regular verb showed starts with a conjunction. So as you can see, there's lots of opportunities to uh, use this sentence with your third graders. I don't know that I would start with this one for a juicy sentence because of how complex it is. Um, maybe start something a little bit simpler. All right, a short quiz. Go ahead and enter your answer into the poll. I've got four who chose B and five who chose C. So we're looking for the complex sentence. And if you remember, the complex sentence is one that has the independent clause and a dependent clause. So the correct answer is B. C is not correct because it has the comma and the cord of uh, the conjunction, but those are two independent clauses joined by the conjunction. All right, moving on to fourth grade. And I just have to tell you that Sarah is appreciating the difficult subject of syntax. It is difficult, and we have a lot to learn. All right. Fourth grade, relative pronouns, relative adverbs, progressive verb tense, modal auxiliaries, prepositional phrases, fragments, run-ons, Greek and Latin, affixes and roots, figurative language, including idioms, adages, proverbs, similes, and metaphors. I'm just noticing Janice's question. Is it okay to start a sentence with a conjunction? I think that's debatable, right? We need to consult Grammar Girl on that one. But of course, the authors will do what they want in books. It's really an art form of writing. And we need to teach kids what does and does not follow rules. But authors don't always follow the rules. Sorry, I'm stuck on the screen. I cannot figure out. How to get my research on. There we go. <laughs> All right. So um, relative pronouns and adverbs. 
Relative pronouns introduce an adjective clause, like that which who, whom, and who. The lady who made your dress. So who being the relative pronoun, referring to the lady. And relative adverbs introduce a group of words that tell about a noun, where, why, when. This is the store where I bought the dress or whatever. Where is the relative adverb describing the store? All right, progressive verb tense. The pro progressive verb tense describes ongoing actions in the present past or future. So are seen, were seen, will be seen. So the word seen is in the present, but the are, were, and will tells us when it is happening. Modal auxiliaries, which is a fancy word for the helping verb, could, will, should, might, may, and must. So Savannah may go to the movies with her friends. The modal auxiliary is may, helping the verb go. Prepositional phrases. Start with a preposition and end with a noun. Examples from the man across the street. Fragments and run-ons. Again, I know we all know what these are, but I thought it would be nice just to have the official definition. Fragments are clauses that cannot stand on their own. And run-ons consist of two or more independent clauses without a conjunction. So maybe that answers our question about that sentence from Win dixie Was that a run-on? Well, there were conjunctions that join all of those independent clauses. Greek and Latin roots, kids should be exposed to in the fourth grade. Um, agree, a bull, a bull meaning able to. Asterisk, the aster means star. Aquarium, the aqua means water. And you can find a whole list of Greek and Latin roots on this website, nsu.edu. All right, figurative language, language that appeals to the senses. So idioms, the words together have a meaning different from the definitions of those individual words, like dead end, pet teeth, over the moon. Adages and proverbs I put together, they're basically the same thing. It's a simple, memorable saying, like ignorance is bliss, or look before you leap. And simile is a description using the word like or as, like as pretty as a flower, while metaphor is describing it as something else, like all the world's a stage. Go Michigan State. Mandy, are you multitasking? I had to use all the world to stage this year at Bed the Lake this year was As You Like It. That was a quote from that. All right. Is this a poll or a text chat? All right. This is a text chat again. Go ahead and read this sentence from The Fisherman and His Wife by Jacob and Will Tom Grimm. This is a third and fourth grade close read exemplar. And type in the text chat what you noticed that could address those fourth grade standards.
So I have a couple of responses, but first I have to uh, address Mandy's comment. She's not watching the game. She's paying attention and notice that MSU is finished complete. Sorry, Mandy. I missed that one. All right, Janice thinks there's got to be a run on. How many AMs can you use to link the independent clauses together? Good question. We need to refer to Grammar Girl for that one. Maybe when we uh, get together next time or someone can answer that question when they are uh, responding to one of their assignments. Complex sentence. Going very quickly now. Prepositional phrase. If you could add in your example, that would be really good. Denise added an example. Pre preposition through the doors. Upon the throne of gold. Ah, good. Uh, relative adverb, where the great throne room was. Nice. Janice is going to look it up. How many conjunctions can you have? Figurative language comparing people to pages stacked in a row. In her hands, on each side, a couple of prepositional phrases. Nice. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the quiz. Go ahead and type in your answer to the quiz. Sorry, give me just one second to get this one up. And Pretend that the able part is underlined on that. Oh. <laughs> if I can do that in the poll. All right, we have all of our responses, and everybody got the correct answer is B. Modal auxiliary is a helping verb, which would be so. All right, last grade that we're going to work on for this class is fifth grade, and we're going to look at interjections, perfect verb tense. My brain is missing today. Correlative conjunctions. Introductory elements, item in a series, items in a series, and chronographs. All right, interjections are words to express emotions, um, wow, and oh. And that definitely is a schoolhouse rock video. I remember that one clearly. Perfect verb tense shows an action that has already been completed. I have seen it, I had seen it, I will have seen it. Correlative conjunctions are used in pairs and indicate a relationship between the elements it connects, or they connect. So both and, not only, but also, either or, whether or. Introductory elements are the clauses that introduce the sentence. They may or may not require a comma. From what I hear, comma, the mail strike will continue. And in Toronto, the Jays play a skydome. Items in a series, which is correct. Bananas, oranges, apples, with commas after bananas and oranges, or bananas, comma, oranges, and apples. Go ahead and text that in. What do you think is right? The first, you could just write one or two. Is it the first one or the second?
Janice says both. Nancy says the first one. Denise says both. Deb says the first one. This is um this is a preferential. Either is correct. The rule is just to be consistent in your writing. And last but not least for our lesson today, homographs are words that have the same spelling but different meanings, like lead and lead. So the reader really has to be paying attention to context and close and close. Close reading, not close. Reading. All right. In your um, text box, go ahead and write what you see in this sentence. An example from The Great Fire by Jim Murphy, another close read exemplar. Their figure of language leads settle across the street. Items in the series with the commas. Then is perfect verb tense. There's an introductory element, a homograph, which Stacy says is wind, could be pronounced wind or wine. Um, preposition of laughter, items in the series again. I hope it's getting easier to identify these since you're becoming more familiar with the term. All right. So we are coming to the end of our webinar. I'm going to give um, a little bit of time to ask questions. So if you have any for me, not that I'm an expert in grammar, but I'm learning with the rest of you. Go ahead and type in any questions you have for me. I can make the list for sixth grade. I think that's a great job for you, Mandy. I think that you would be perfect expert to do that for us. Um, and yes, Janice, we will be going over the next hour's assignment on the next slide. I'll give about one more minute if anybody has another question.
Stacy volunteered to get a sixth grade list together with Nancy. And uh, Mandy's asking, should fourth graders only focus on idioms, adages, proverbs, similes, and metaphors for figure of language? I believe that's a yes, but you can look back in your standards to be sure. Um, a good student-friendly site for some of the grammar to use with students. There's a bunch of them, and I will just Google grammar for kids. There's so many to uh, look at, but I do have a list compiled, and I can have that for the last um, night to give that as a resource. Denise looks in the standard. She sees that um, the answer to Mandy's question is yes. That is everything that's in there for fourth grade. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the last slide. Yes, Mandy, we agree. We do need to get this out there. Um, it's kind of, it reminds me of what's happening in math, that we really need to come to terms with what we don't know and really understand what we're trying to teach the kids. So here's your next step. For the next hour, um, your assignment is to go through your grade level standards and highlight the terms that we discussed during the webinar. So now it's your time to focus specifically on your grade level, and you're probably going to want to go through the previous grade levels as well. Because again, the kids are really not familiar with um, what they should know from the previous years. And then the next really important step, and that's um, a topic of discussion that's been happening in our room with Sarah and Kathy, who have been in here watching as well, is how do you address these standards with your students? So are they going to be responsible to know the terms? Or are they expected to use, identify, form, and produce um, what's expected from those grammar or language standards. And you'll see those words specifically used in the standards, use, identify, form, and produce. And you need to gain an understanding of how you're going to do that with your kids. Do they need to be able to say what an idiom is? Or do they need to be able to read an idiom and understand it and maybe use it in their own writing? It is difficult to teach this, especially in the goofy sentence forum, without being able to name it. And I actually named um, the word clause with my second graders today because we were talking about um, an introductory element that was in our sentence and why that comma was there. And it kind of helps them understand a little bit better when I named it for them, but I would never expect them to be able to name that again. Um, and the next step, consider how you can address these standards using a DC sentence. So this will apply to your other assignment of creating a lesson around a juicy sentence. And then post that, a reflection of that work on Edmodo. And that is the end of our webinar. I'm getting you out about eight minutes early, unless anybody has any other questions for me. All right, thank you, and I'll be looking forward to seeing your work on Ednodo.